Hi, everybody. My name is Cynthia Kane, and I am one of the reference and instruction librarians with the Emporia State University Libraries and Archives. And in this video, I'm going to give you a short overview of a database called Psychology and Behavioral Sciences Collection. Now, the quickest way to get to our library's webpage and then our databases is to go up here and go to emporia.edu slash library. And this will take you directly to the library's webpage. When you want to search any of the databases that are owned by the library, you can either click on this link for databases or the icon. And if you're not quite sure of a database to search, you can always click on this drop down menu for all subjects and find a subject that corresponds with the topic that you're searching for. Now, in this particular case, I know the specific name of the database, which is psychology and behavioral sciences collection. <clears throat> and so I'm going to go directly to that database under the letter P. Now, many of you are going to be searching uh, for databases and for information off campus, not, not on campus itself. And when that happens, you will see a screen that will look like this, and you'll be prompted to enter your ESU username. And that's going to be the first part of <clears throat> your email address without the g.emporia.edu. And the password that you use to access your email, Canvas, and other campus resources. So it will be the same password. And we'll log in. And now we are at the basic search for the psychology and behavioral sciences collection. Notice up here that this says EBSCOhost. A lot of people will think that they're searching something called EBSCOhost. That's actually not the name of the database, however. You always want to check down here to make sure that you're in the appropriate database that you want to be searching in. Now, I'm going to go to an advanced search, which I highly recommend when you're searching any of our databases. The advanced search will let you do a lot of limits that a basic search will not do. And I'm going to show you some of those limits in one, one moment. Now, this is not necessary if you're doing just a quick search in a database, but if you want to save articles and search history so that you can retrieve them later on, I highly recommend that you go up here to a link called sign in. The sign in feature will let you sign in to something called your EBSCOhost account. Now you don't have to create a separate username or password for this. If you click on continue with Google, you can choose your g.emporia.edu or your emporia.edu address. Enter your password again if you're prompted. And you can use those same credentials to sign in to an EBSCOhost account. If you do this for the first time, you'll be uh, seeing a screen right before this that will ask you to accept uh, the guidance and then the agreement with EBSCOhost. You can go ahead and click on yes for that. So now I'm going to show you some different ways that you can search in psychology and behavioral sciences collection. This is a good resource for uh, fairly specific information about psychology uh, and related disciplines. It can also overlap into the field of education, counselor education, and so forth. This is not the same as the psych info database, however. If you have a professor or a faculty member who wants you to search specifically in the psych info database, that's when you would want to go back, back over here and click on the psych info database instead. However, this is a good general one 
And I would say it's good for introductory information about psychology and related disciplines. So the first part that I always recommend when you're doing an advanced search in the database is to limit your search to keywords or key terms that appear in the abstract of articles or other resources. The reason is that if we don't limit at this point, I could do a broad keyword search for something such as art therapy. And if I'm not limiting to the words art therapy, specifically in the abstracts of articles or other items, the database is gonna go out and it's gonna search in the full text of a lot of articles and it will pull up a lot of references that mention the words art therapy, but it may not really have anything to do with my topic. The abstract will help you narrow and focus your search much more effectively. So before we start entering terms, we're gonna go down here. And quite often, you may have an assignment in which your professor says that they want you to find peer reviewed journal articles. And that just means that the journal articles are more scholarly and approach. Uh, the uh, documentation has been reviewed by peers in that field, experts in the field. So if you click on peer reviewed, that's going to help limit your search to peer reviewed articles, as opposed to things that are a little bit more general. Now, psychology and behavioral sciences collection covers quite a bit more than articles. If I only want references to articles or the full text of articles, under document type, I can click on article. And depending upon how quickly I need my research to be done, I could click on full text, which would limit my search just to articles that are available in full text in this specific database. I'm not going to do this right now though, because I might actually wind up eliminating some things that might be useful for my search, but may be available in full text and other resources. So we're gonna go back up here. So I'm going to start typing in the term of eating disorders. And notice what's happening here. This is very similar to Google uh, on listing suggested terms for searching. If I started typing in the word eating, I could search for just eating disorders, or I could broaden it out a little bit more to eating disorders or anorexia or bulimia or disordered eating. I like to use the suggested terms when I'm searching like this, because sometimes it will come up with words that I hadn't thought of the first time, and it'll give me a broader overview of a topic. Let's limit our search now, perhaps to an audience. So I started to type in the word child, and when I did that, I'm getting children or adolescents or youth or child or teenager. I could do a few more limits right now, but let's go ahead and search. And in reality, I would want to limit my search quite a bit more because I have over 1700 articles, but for the purposes of this tutorial, we're going to work with what we have right now. Notice that as I do my search, this first article, DSM-4 versus DSM-5, is actually available in PDF full text. So I could click on the PDF full text, and I could read this article online. <clears throat> I could download it onto my computer, but I could also do something else over here. One reason I had um, the recommendation to sign into an EBSCOhost account is that as you find articles and other references that look interesting, you can go over here to something called add to folder. And I have a folder up here that already has some articles in it. I just added this article and the information about it to this folder of information. And since I'm signed into my account, that article will stay in my folder until I decide that I am done with it and I want to delete it from my folder. So that's another big reason that I'm a big fan of signing into an EBSCOhost account. Now I'm going to click on result list over here rather than back. And the reason I didn't click on this back button is that since I'm logged in to a database remotely, if I clicked on the back button, it might say that I had timed out of that search. If you click on the areas within the database, such as result lists that are, again, within that database, 
you'll still be within your search and you won't be timed out of the search. Now notice that this has changed over here. This shows now that I added this into my folder. So I do have quite a few articles here. I have some again that are in PDF full text. But I have one down here, eating related psychopathology, that might look rather interesting for my search. But as you can see, there's no link here to PDF full text. So this would be my next step, and this is actually not too obvious on the screen. I want to see if this article happens to be available in full text in another database or another resource from our library. So you notice that I highlighted the title of the article, and I'm going to go back up here. I am a big believer in keeping a tab for your search always open homepage because you never know when you might need to go back to that and you don't want to navigate out of your search in your database if you're not done with it yet. Let's go now to something called our discovery search catalog. This resource is very good for items that are owned by the library or accessible through the library. I didn't start with it to search because it's a huge database and I would get far too many results. What I'm going to do now to help me is paste the title of that article and search for it. Because I want to see if this specific article might be available from another database in our library. This is not going to be available. And the reason I know that is if this article had been available in another database, I probably would have seen it here with the first or the second result. It did lead me to some ebooks though that I might want to look at later on and ebooks are also accessible to you at no charge. But I didn't find that one immediately available. So when I go back to psychology and behavioral sciences collection, since I did not find that article immediately available, I could now click on this link for interlibrary loan this item. And this logon will be your ESU username and password again. It won't be a separate account. If you've not done interlibrary loan before to request a copy of a book or an article from another library, you would get a screen right before this one that would ask you to set up a personal record and you only have to do that one time. I've already done that. And the beauty of this process is that when I clicked on the interlibrary loan beside it and I logged in, Notice what happened here. The database automatically recognized the elements of that article, so it filled out the form for me, and I don't have to fill out anything else. All I would have to do here is click on Submit Request, and within just a few business uh, days or working days, you would receive a PDF of this article in your g.emporia.edu account. So this is a very quick way of getting access to information. This is actually why I did not limit my initial search just to the full text in psychology and behavioral sciences collection, because you may find some things that would be interesting later on. There's something else you can do with these records as well. You will often be asked in a lot of classes when you're writing research papers, to use a specific citation style when you are citing your references or citing your articles. This database contains a button that's called Cite. And if we go over here, this will convert the record that you're looking at into a variety of citation styles. Now, some of you may wind up using the MLA citation style. You can copy and paste that citation into a working bibliography. If you would be required to use APA, there's something that I do need to tell you about. Psychology and Behavioral Sciences Collection does not always recognize all the conventions of APA style. What I mean by that is that with this APA citation that was generated, 
the main words of the article title stayed capitalized. Now in APA style, we actually have to convert those to lowercase. So words such as psychopathology, food addiction, and so forth, those would need to be changed to lowercase. So what you would need to do is, after you copy the reference and paste that into your bibliography, you are gonna to need to go back through and edit those changes, such as putting those words into lowercase to make that into proper APA style. Very important to remember because this specific database is not intuitive enough to recognize all the necessary elements of APA style. I caution that for all citation styles as well. Make sure that you are using either a print manual or a reliable online source for your specific citation style to make sure that it conforms to that style and to the preferences of your instructor. So let's scroll back over here. I'm going to close this out. I mentioned that we were adding articles to a folder. Now, when I click on this folder, you're actually going to see a lot of articles because I've been saving a lot of articles from a lot of different databases. When I go over here, I can actually create what's called a new custom folder or a subfolder. And that can be a wonderful way of keeping your research organized if you're doing a lot of research for different classes. So I could call this one eating disorders and children. Basically call it by my topic name. And then I can move articles to a specific subfolder that I have created. Again, this is a very good way of keeping your items organized. Now over here, you're going to see something called print or email. You can use this if you wanted to print out any copies of articles and references or if you decided that you wanted to email them to yourself or to someone else, if you're working on a group assignment, for example. You can put an email address here and I was mentioning the citation just a few seconds ago. If you email articles to yourself, you can ask then in the email that they be organized and that a bibliography or references list be put together in a specific citation format. And that will usually appear toward the end of your email. <clears throat> now I am gonna give you another hint here. It's always good to put something in the subject line if you're gonna be emailing articles to yourself through an EBSCOhost database. The reason is that this can actually be flagged as a spam email or a junk email, and you may not see that immediately in your email result, results. So I would check the spam folder, check the junk email folder if you don't see your results immediately. But if you put something in that subject line, sometimes what it will do is circumvent the spam or the junk email folder. So I always put something in that subject line. And we'll go back here. We can always start again search. That's a very quick overview of using psychology and behavioral sciences collection for these types of sources and this type of research. Going back to the library's webpage, if you ever have any questions, you can chat with us via Zoom. If this Ask a Librarian window is open, you can chat with us directly as well. That means that we're staffing our chat if you have questions or I'm having, having any problems with your research. And you can also email us at librev01 at emporia.edu or call us at 620-341-5207. Thank you for watching this video and good luck with your research.